WWE makes some changes, the wrestling world mourns the passing of Sid, my review of Raw and Uncle Howdy's debut, and more. I'm Luke Owen, I still haven't really got my voice back from All In, and this is the WrestleTalk News. Support WrestleTalk! Last night's terrific episode of Monday Night Raw saw the in-ring debut of Uncle Howdy and two men qualify for the Intercontinental Championship number one contender's Fatal 4-Way. But the thing that really caught my eye was the angle between Bronson Reed and Braun Strowman. We'll cover it in the Raw review in full, but here's the headline. Bronson Reed did a tsunami onto a car roof and the windows exploded and it was awesome. WrestleBoast posted on Twitter prior to the show that there was a spot planned for Raw which had a lot of buzz backstage and added sources say they were back and forth on the details of the angle. WrestleVotes would later post a clip of that spot confirming that that was the angle they'd heard about. But that wasn't the only change being made to Raw last night. With Pat McAfee taking some time off due to obligations to ESPN's college game day, Corey Graves made his return to the color commentary position on Raw alongside Michael Cole. They later confirmed in the show that that duo will become the commentary team for SmackDown when it makes its return to USA Network in September. This will set up the debut of Joe Tessitore, who will take over as the lead commentator for Monday Night Raw. Although unconfirmed, it is believed that Wade Barrett will be his broadcast partner. So Raw will have Tessa Torre and presumably Barrett, while SmackDown will have Graves and Cole. That is until the Netflix move in 2025, as Raw will once again have Cole and McAfee, while Tessa Torre, Graves and Barrett will take over SmackDown. Are we all clear on that? But sadly, we must end this news portion of this video with the passing of Sid Udi, better known as Sid Vicious. His son Gunner posted the news on his Facebook page, noting that his father lost his battle with cancer at the age of 63. Sean Rossap noted on Fightful that Sid kept this very private. Gunner wrote he was a man of strength, kindness, and love, and his presence will be greatly missed. Sid was a true giant of the industry, both literally and figuratively, working the scenes in the late 80s before signing with WCW in 1991, where he became part of the Four Horsemen. He would later jump to the WWF to feud with Hulk Hogan for WrestleMania as Sid Justice, and then head back to WCW for a brief stint before going back to the WWF to win the World Championship twice, headlining WrestleMania against The Undertaker. He had a brief run in ECW but left due to the company struggling money issues and again returned to WCW where he won their World Championship in 2000. Sadly, due to injury, Sid retired in 2001, an injury so gruesome I think it's been used on a thousand different YouTube thumbnails. But he did some work with the WWA in Australia and Juggalo Championship Wrestling in the US. Miraculously, Sid did wrestle a fair amount following that injury in the late 2000s, facing the likes of Jerry Lawler, Jim Duggan, Too Cold Scorpio, X-Pac, and Eddie Kingston in a five-second match. He even returned to WWE in 2012, where he beat Heath Slater in the build to Raw 1000 and had his final wrestling match in 2017. And, of course, he was a big softball player and fan. Ric Flair, Sting, Eric Bischoff, PCO, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and Booker T, and many more have paid their tributes to Sid on social media, while Xavier Woods wore a black armband with Sid's name on it on last night's Raw. We'd like to invite you to leave your comments down below with your favorite Sid moments. Thank you, big man. You will be missed. And before we get into the Raw review, please do check out this clip from our most recent Parts Fun Known list, where Tempest looks at wrestling moves so dangerous they were banned. The Stomp. In addition to being a solid 65 base power, 100 accuracy move with the chance to make the opponent flinch, the Stomp was one of the moves that bit the dust as a result of WWE's family-friendly presentation. The Curb Stomp has been used by many a wrestler, but its most famous and beloved variant was the one used by Seth Rollins to win many a match, including the main event of WrestleMania 31. The only problem was that Vince McMahon, in his infinite wisdom, thought the move looked too violent, and there was some worry that children would try and copy the move, despite the very clear instructions provided by WWE to never try this at home that we definitely all listen to. And now it's time for my review of Monday Night Raw, aka Bronson Reed Rules edition of Monday Night Raw in about five minutes. The new Judgment Day opened the show to recap the beating they gave to the Terror Twins last week and noted that they deserve it for stabbing their group in the back. Dom also announced that he's entering into the IC title tournament and he's gonna win the whole thing. Rey Mysterio and the rest of the LWO came out with Mr. Mysterio saying that his son has zero balls, is a jackass, and he's gonna slap the mustache off his face. This 
this led to an eight-man tag following a brawl, which got really fun in the final stretch, and the crowd was super into it. LWO doing the crisscross dive was superb. Crisscross will make you dive, dive. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Liv Morgan saved Dominic Mysterio from being hit by a splash after the 619, and he rolled up Ray for the win. Liv Morgan has now helped Dominic Mysterio pin his dad twice, furthering his reasons to pick Liv over Rhea. Very good stuff this was. The Terra Twins ran down to beat them all up, with Finn, Dom, and Liv escaping, leaving JD, McDumbass, and Carlito to take the bumps. Terra Twins later cut a promo saying they were the villains of the story, and Judgment Day will now have to face their devils. Damage Control took on Pure Fusion Collective in your Didn't We Already See This Match of the Week, and they won rather easily again. And here is your obligatory, this is your only women's match on the show. And unlike last week, where I was wrong to say that on a technicality, because this wasn't really a match, it was more of an angle. This was, for sure, the only women's match of the week. Actually, let me, let me double check that. Where's my phone? Got my notes. Yeah, uh, Xavier Woods. Yeah. No, I was right. Yep, yeah, that's right. The only women's match on the show. I was right this time. Maybe I'll say there was two just in case. Drew McIntyre came out for a promo where he made fun of CM Punk's promo style, noting that he is rather predictable. He said that Punk keeps talking about the company being hot right now, but he was sat on his ass at home while everyone else did the hard work to get it this hot, and now he's trying to take credit for it. And the problem is you, the fans. You keep chanting his name, and it feeds Punk's ego and makes his head get bigger and bigger. You fans, are enablers. Punk attacked Drew from behind and they had a good brawl with security breaking it up. Punk beat up some of them and stared Drew down. This was a very good go home angle and one that was needed for Bash in Berlin. It hasn't felt like the heat has been there for this second match like there was for the first one, which is kind of to be expected, I guess. And a few people did defend the idea of a strap match in the comments of last week's video as I was quite down on it, but I've not heard a better descriptor of the match than from our very own Tempest, who noted that a strap match where you have to touch all four corners has taken this blood feud and turned it into a Mario Party mini game. So credit to WWE for trying to hype this up as beating your opponents so bad they can't even stand anymore and you can touch the corners. I still think it's a lame gimmick, but I do appreciate the effort. Jey Uso took on Kofi Kingston and Karrion Cross in a fun triple threat where the winner would advance to a fatal four-way for the IC title number one contendership, and it was cool seeing Jey and Kofi work together on Cross given their history, and in the end, Jey picked up the win with the splash. They did have a backstage segment earlier in the show with Kofi and Woods and their uneasiness, which I thought might play more into this tournament, but... Spoilers, both men get eliminated. I get that we want to push Jey Uso, otherwise Rikishi will have more harsh words to say about WWE on a podcast or something, and really Jey Uso is the right choice, but I am kind of more into this Woods and Kofi thing at the moment. Gunther cut a promo on Instagram from Europe, and Randy Orton came out for a promo to hype their match at Bash in Berlin. With no Gunther there in the building, there wasn't really much more that they could do, so Randy just covered a lot of the ground we've already covered and said that they'll win this Saturday. I did like that Orton noted that he was the youngest man to win the World Heavyweight Championship, and he was the man to retire the belt, so he wants to etch his name into this new title's lineage. I did think that was a nice touch. The best thing on the show by far, though, was Bronson Reed versus Braun Strowman. The match wasn't much of anything apart from Reed's big dive because they just walked out of the building with no finish to continue brawling. Reed took a choke slam on a car and he got pounced onto another one and then hit a tsunami onto Strowman on top of the car, which made all of the windows explode. And it was awesome proper sports entertaining this was. The car effect was great, and Strowman sold it brilliantly afterwards. They later said that Reed somehow walked away with no medical attention, but no one really knows what condition he's in, so that will likely play into the triple threat he's got next week for the icy title shot. Give him the win, though. I don't care if it annoys Rikishi. I want to see Reed versus Breaker at this point. But more likely, I think this will give Reed the out for not winning next week or qualifying, then not winning the Fatal 4-Way, because Bron Breaker cut a promo where he was really really focused on Jey Uso, which sort of sets him up to win the whole thing. Pete Dunne also qualified for that fatal four-way by beating Xavier Woods and The Miz in a very fun three-way match. This was probably the best match of the night. We got a lovely video tribute to Sid, and then Chad Gable took on Uncle Howdy in the character's debut, Bo Dallas's first match in nearly five years, and almost one year to the day 
that his brother passed away. The emotions were there for this, and the crowd was super behind Uncle Howdy, popping for all of his references and tributes to both Bray Wyatt and Brody Lee, and were really behind his comeback. Gable gave him an angle slam on the announcer's table, with Howdy just getting back in at nine, an American maid interfered following a ref bump, and the rest of the Wyatts brawled with the Creed and Ivy Nile, as Howdy gave Gable the sister Abigail in the middle of the ring for the win. Gable once again sold the move like a complete psychopath. Much like the trios match a few weeks ago, this was basically a perfect debut match. It gave you everything you needed, some great drama, and that feel-good win. You couldn't ask for much more. As a go-home show for Bash in Berlin, this wasn't a particularly good episode of Monday Night Raw as it didn't sell me on the pay-per-view, but as a general episode of television, yeah, this was great. Now go check out Tempest's latest list on Parts Unknown, where he looks at wrestling moves that were once banned.